this is the founder's wall. Um, all the people who were instrumental in starting this university uh, have their pictures on this wall. Uh, the founding president, Miran Arbabian, uh, Zovak Avakian, he was the vice uh, minister of education at the time. He was very enthusiastic. He helped a lot with the uh, with starting this university. Uh, Vartkes Barsam, an entrepreneur also, and a big uh, supporter of this university. Uh, Tioni Kondos was the assistant, special assistant to the president of uh, UC uh, system at the time. She was also uh, the secretary of the, in the first board of trustees for the university. Of course, Armen Derkurian, the current president, and also founding dean of School of Engineering. Uh, William Fraser, he was the provost of the UC system when the university was founded. Uh, Vili Karutunyan, uh, unfortunately, uh, is no longer with us. He passed away. Uh, he was the Minister of uh, Education and Science uh, in the, the Republic of Armenia. Um, of course, this is uh, the late Stepan Karamardian, the founding dean of uh, the School of Business. Mrs. Louise Simone, the president of AGBU at the time. John Markham from uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Carl Pister, who then became the um, uh, chancellor of UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Lion Porter was also from uh, the UC uh, Irvine uh, campus. And uh, Yuri Sarkisian, uh, he was the rector of the Polytechnic University in Armenia. And uh, he was the person who said to our men, it would be great if the diaspora can start an American-style university in Armenia at that morning breakfast when they gathered before they went skiing. So... Uh, this um, is important wall. This is called the Founder's Wall, and it is right outside the Akian Gallery on the fourth floor. These are the people with uh, the resolve and imagination to uh, get the uh, concept of this, this university become a reality. Next to his office is the provost office and the two vice presidents. Okay. So, uh, welcome to uh, American University of Armenia. And this is the second time I meet these two wonderful people. And so we went did some tour of the building. It's an amazing place. And so we wanted to have a little chit chat with uh, the president. And uh, well, uh, thank you for allowing us in. And just. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your name, your position, everything, because I don't want to say something and mess it up. Well, I'm, uh, welcome, uh, Wally. I'm Armin Derkuregian. I'm the president, the fourth president of the American University of Armenia. But I'm also one of the co-founders of the university. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I've been with the university from the beginning. Uh, I was the founding dean of engineering. Then in 2011-12, I was the uh, provost, interim provost for one year under Bruce Borosian. He was the president then. And I've been uh, the fourth president since 2014. So uh, I was a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, for many, many years. And I retired from there to be uh, serving here. Okay, so on your business card it says 91, this, this thing started. Yes. So isn't that, that was the time where uh, independent time and uh, also the Karabakh war and earthquake and was lots of things happened like the, that period. Well, the idea for the university came about after the 1988 earthquake. Uh, I'm an earthquake engineer, and so is Mehran Agbabian. Uh, the two of us were members of a reconnaissance team of seismologists, earthquake engineers, scientists, 
that were sent here by the National Academy of Sciences of the United States uh, as a way of assisting the Soviet Union then to deal with the earthquake problem. So we came here a week after the earthquake. Uh, and it was uh, during a second meeting, a second visit I had after the earthquake in February of 1989 that this, the idea of a, an American-style university came about. And then Mehran Akbabian and I wrote a proposal in March 2000, 1989 uh, to establish the university and uh, among several other very interesting responses we received, there was a, a letter, a short letter from Luis Simon, who was the vice pres executive vice president of AGBU at the time. She said, this is a bright idea, and we are interested in it, and we will put money behind it. So we had an idea, we had money behind it, and uh, later, uh, okay. Uh, how did you three of you got together? Where uh, did you guys know each other? Well, Miran and I knew each other. I used to work at Habibin Associates as a consultant, so I knew Miran, and we were both uh, earthquake engineers. He's also an earthquake engineer, and we were both in this post-earthquake reconnaissance team, scientific team. So we knew each other. And then uh, we wrote this proposal to many, many people, including to AGBU. So Luis Simon received this propo letter proposal from us. Uh, uh, and uh, Miran at the time, uh, we both knew, of course, Luis Simon. And we the knew AGBU. Idea of college, how did that happen? Well, the idea of a university. Well, to be very specific, uh, it was the last Sunday of February 1989. A friend, Stepan Zargarian, said, let's go to Tzachkatsur for ski. But before going for ski, we went to the home of uh, Suren Kevorkian, who was a professor at the Polytechnic. And there were Polytechnic faculty, professors from Polytechnic, around a breakfast table of hash and vodka. Whoa. You know what hash is. Oh, I know, I know, I know. And we were talking about ways the diaspora could help Armenia. And Yuri Sarkisian, who was the rector of the Polytechnic, was sitting across from me on the table. He said uh, that it would be very good if we could have American-style education in Armenia. When he said this, it immediately, in my mind, I started thinking of Americans to Beirut. I thought it would be possible to have an American university here. So uh, that day during skiing in Tzachkatsur, and on my way back home, uh, I was constantly thinking, formulating, how could we propose this? So I got there, I wrote this draft. Then I contacted Miran, I said, will you join me in this proposal? He agreed. So we prepared this letter and we sent it out to anyone who had said anything about Armenia after the earthquake, congressmen, governors, whoever, you know. And so we sent more than 60, 70 letters out and so Luis responded. And then Stepan Karamardian, a few months later, Stepan Karamardian joined us. He was also thinking of doing something in the area of business. So he joined, and the three of us uh, worked together. And then Luis insisted that she wanted a, uh, to work with institutions, not individuals. So we decided, because I was at the University of California, Berkeley, Stepan Karamardian was at the University of California in Riverside. He was dean of business there. And Miran Akbabian was a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley. So we all three were UC affiliated. So we decided that we will write a letter. Actually, Louise wrote the letter to David Gardner, who was the president of the University of California system and said, we have this idea, all from 
University of California affiliate people, and we are willing to put money behind it. Will you help us in establishing the university? So Gardner, after a month or so, uh, said, yes, they'll look into it. So he appointed a committee chaired by Bill Fraser, who was his provost. This is the second man in the whole UC system. And so he put together a, a group of about 10, 11 people. Yes. Yes. So in June, May and June of 1990, this team came to Armenia. There were very high level University of California people, deans, provost, uh, et cetera, the chief architect. And there were the three of us, the Armenians, Miran, Stepan, and me. And we came here and visited universities, research institutes, culture, Matanataran, museum, and uh, various places to assess whether Armenia was the right place to set up an American university. And this is in 1990. Right. So went back, wrote a report, we said, yes, Armenia is, is a good place for that. There is a long history of valuing education. We went to Glatzor, for example, the old university, you know, uh, what is it, 6th, 7th century or 10th century university, that only the ruins. We went there, they saw that. We went to uh, Hakpat, we went to Sanahin, which also functioned as a scholarly uh, you know, place, a uh, center of scholarship. Uh, and so went back and we prepared a report saying, yes, Armenia is the right place. And it took a few months, I'm sure they checked with the Department of State and other organizations. And finally, the decision came in March of 1991 to go ahead. So we came here in early summer of 1991 to start the university. This building was given to us by the government of Armenia. This was the Congress Hall of the Communist Party. And so we came here, we had no students, no faculty, no staff, nothing. And huge building, and how do you start a university? It's, it's an interesting experience. So the initial years were very difficult because 91, 92, 93 were very, very dark ages in Army. No electricity, no water. So there was every reason for this venture to fail, but we persisted. And there was one, sh one meeting, short meeting, where, there, where we discussed should we continue or just quit. But we decided, no, we have to go forward. And so, uh, so in, it, it happened in spite of all those difficulties. It's a miracle that it happened. But, but where were you guys traveling back and forth? Or you stayed here that time? Or you become resident here? Or? We were traveling back and forth. We were traveling. We hired. We had to go back and forth. We had. We had to hire people in the U.S. We had to set up offices there. Offices here. We hired uh, people who were doing the administration. We hired faculty. We hired deans, and gradually, and then Miran was appointed as the founding president. He had a long history of. Uh, managing, administrating, administering his company as well as he was chair of uh, uh, Agbabian Associates, very well known uh, engineering company. But then when this happened, he was already, he had sold his company. He was uh, chair of Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Southern California. You were doing your professor job and his yes, we were doing at the same time. So if you look in my list of publications, you will see there are a few years there, there isn't much activity because we were focused. We were coming here back and forth, and it took a lot of time. And then Stepan Karamardian became the founding dean of the College of Business. I became the founding dean of the College of uh, Engineering. Uh, we set up a, 
uh, a board, in, board of trustees, uh, which is a 501c3 uh, organization, 501c3 organization in California. And um, the board at that time, had uh, almost half of it, was University of California high-level officials. Even now, uh, a third of the board is UC people, very high level. Provost, former provost, chancellors. The chair of the board, Larry Peets, is the former provost of the University of California. That's, that's amazing, accompl amazing accomplishment, really. And, and especially the, the, the timing. That was the worst timing. There were, uh, I believe they were even uh, cutting the trees, burning, because there was no fuel. and. And, and, and then you guys were thinking, college, college, we're going to build the university here. You know, like, it's so bizarre. <laughs> it's just. If you talk to the first cohort, particularly of our students, they'll tell you that this was a heaven for them. Uh, they, it was cold out there. They, they would come here. There was something to do. They, the, the whole city was just shut down. This was an oasis in, this, in the whole city. Uh, so they are extremely devoted to this university because particularly during those years, the university provided them with lunch, free lunch. There were, uh, there were students who were staying in the building sleeping because they were there was no transportation, and their homes were far. They couldn't go back and forth in the you know, snow. I don't know how many people would believe this, that well, the country was in, in shambles, and here is those guys coming building I mean, a university. At that time, you asked me this. I was, are you crazy? Yes. Well, we actually, we, there, there was a, um, when the affiliation between this university and the University of California was signed, uh, there was an interview with uh, newspapers, and San Francisco Chronicle reporter said, are you sure this is the right time with all the earthquake and the war with yeah. Azerbaijan over in Karabakh? This, is this the right time to set up a university? Well, my answer at the time was, you know, things like this you do when, when at yeah, difficult times. You, you know, things are going easy, Things are well. People don't think of bringing something entirely new. Yeah, it's, it's, and, really, yes. it's really historical, historical uh, accomplishment. This is. May yeah. I interject? Sure. I, I, I remember vividly in those days, there was a lot of criticism in the diaspora about this idea of starting university, as you mentioned. Um, however, uh, I also want to add to that, that uh, this university gave hope. It was a new beginning. Obviously, the communist socialist system had not worked for them. Uh, their way of engineering resulted in massive deaths when these buildings, those buildings collapsed. There was big need for, these types, for this type of uh, a model for educating the next generation. So um, although people in the diaspora wanted to help by sending donations, uh, food, uh, goods, and blankets, etc., this university was the model where one might uh, use, instead of sending them fish, f teach them how to fish. So uh, in that way, that's why the first cohort of uh, graduates feel deeply indebted to this university because in those dark years where everybody was depressed, not only because they, they had lost their homes or relatives, but their, uh, their future was unknown, this university promised them a brighter future. And many of them, right after graduation, found work, uh, opportunities for jobs abroad and here. And that gave hope for a better future for many Armenians. Well, that, was, <clears throat> that was my other question uh, I was going to ask. Is, uh, you know, a country is education, government, and industry. Your job is to produce those education work, workforce, the government to facilitate, and the business 
is to hire those people. But do you find that the people all these years that you, you're producing, is there demand for it? Are they getting jobs or they're leaving the country? What is the status on that? Well, we keep track of everything in this university. Uh, and we have a, uh, an office called Institutional Research Office. So we follow everything. Uh, about 73% of our graduates are living uh, in Armenia and working here. Uh, so uh, a higher percentage uh, than I would say of the general public since independence. Uh, many of them are in leading positions in the country. They work in positions that bring high salaries. For example, they work for foreign organizations. They work many, many in high tech. Uh, many uh, work for NGOs, uh, for banks, for, uh, they're all over Yerevan. Uh, and so uh, they are sought after because they have good knowledge of language, of course, but also Western methods. They are trained in um, thinking uh, independently, critical thinking. They uh, are tend to be more entrepreneurial and innovative, and so they are sought after by the industry. So, do you do you cater? Uh the education to match the industries, what is in there? Every degree program that we start, uh, we first do a market research to make sure that the graduates can have jobs in Armenia. If there are no job opportunities in Armenia, we will not start that degree program. But I hear, I hear there is about six, seven thousand jobs available for IT. It's, they can't find those people. Is that how much truth is? I don't know. Well, that's uh, maybe not five, six thousand, but there are at least three thousand or so uh, jobs available. And IT or computers, we have computer science undergraduate, computer science graduate program, and this year we started data science. These are, and engineering science last year. These are areas that the uh, industry needs. Uh, it's true, uh, uh, although we try to attract as many qualified students as we can, the total output from all universities is not sufficient to satisfy the need of the IT industry. The problem is not at the university level, the problem is at the school level. Kids from graduating from high schools are not well prepared for science and engineering courses. The pendulum has gone too far. You know, they're going more into humanities and business. Uh, business is the most popular field here in our university. And uh, we would prefer to in fact, we are restricting admission to it, trying to channel more into computer science. But uh, the, the school system needs to uh, reform so that in the Soviet time, math and science was very popular. It has changed. It has to go back to that. You're talking about yeah. Uh, computer science. Business. Engineering sciences. Computer science. Computer science. Computer science. Business. Business. Yeah. When I get to in business, I mean computer. I would say from primary up. Yes, primary, middle, and high school. Yes. Um, so, how come you don't teach medicine? Actually, we did a study. We sent a uh, dean uh, of UCSF here years ago, together with uh, Dr. Krikor Sorikian, 
to investigate and see whether we should start a school of medicine. Well, there is a big medical school here, year one medical university, Herazi Medical School. You are one of their students. It is a big school, it, it, uh, it, is, it has good program, and it produces many doctors. It's a huge uh, program. So there was no uh, obvious need for medicine. However, what we determined is that there was no public health program. So we have a master of public health program that was developed then and now it's more than maybe 20 years that we have that program. So how many students are in that program? Uh, about 40 or so, yeah. Were you? Yeah. Plus A? Well, well, we, well, yes. I, I don't know if that's, you know, we, uh, we think uh, the university should be inclusive. We should provide equal opportunities to all students, regardless of their gender, their economic uh, status, uh, their yes. geographic location, Yerevan or the Marses, or their sexual orientation. Sexual orientation. We, uh, and I, I'm very strongly against discriminating against uh, individuals on the basis of uh, any of these factors that I mentioned, including religion, uh, including ethnic background, uh, citizenship, if we have students, we treat them equally in all aspects. So that's your answer. Uh, I hope there are some more questions. You have to keep going. Thank you very much. Should women stay home, take care of the baby, or should send them to? Like, questions I thought I wouldn't hear this in Armenia. What is your thought? What is the status of a woman in Armenia? So my personal opinion, based on observation, strictly observation, I have no data to support my claims. Um, I um, have found Armenian women in Armenia to be highly industrious, highly educated, and uh, very um, goal-oriented. Um, they ha have careers, brilliant careers, and at the same time, they are brilliant homemakers. They have uh, very good cooking skills. They make the best katas, the best um, dishes that I have tasted. And almost everybody that, I, that have invited me to their homes have shown uh, excellent culinary skills. Uh, so they have perfected both skills, the homemaker skills and the career woman skills. So, um, and nowadays I think that question whether a woman should do this or that is totally um, irrelevant anymore because women have reached a certain level of independence and they can make their own choices in regard to whether they want to stay home and raise their own children, if that's what they wish to do, or if they want to hire a babysitter and uh, who will take care of their children while they're at work and advancing in their careers. So uh, that's, I think, up to the individual woman to make that decision, and her husband maybe, but it should be the primary decision maker on those issues should be the woman, how she feels uh, she should uh, live her life um, and uh, responsibly uh, towards her family and her children and herself. Uh, the time for a man or a mother-in-law or a community to decide whether a woman should stay home or go to work, those days are way gone. How many years you've been living here, resident of Yerevan? Frankly, um, I have uh, since 20, 2016, when I quit my job, my work in the United States, I have been uh, spending a good chunk of my of the year here. I spent the three month or two and a half in the fall 
and two months and a half in the spring in Armenia, and the rest of the time I spend them with uh, my children, my grown children, uh, in the United States. So I, I haven't lived permanently in Armenia uh, 12 months out of the year, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, well, yeah, because I wanted to know, like, what do you, do you, do you go to the Armenians' home? Do they, do you mingle with them? Do you understand their daily life, stuff like that? Yes, I interact with local Armenian women, who, women that I've come to know through uh, our social interactions here, if that's what you want to know. But not, not on a daily basis. So They're all very busy with their careers. So do you see, since uh, they started this college, the changes in the society here since 91, things developing, it's getting better? The uh, family lives and... Well, um, um, definitely there are positive changes all around. Uh, since the university started, well, the university started in 1991, and uh, maybe many of the changes are due to this university because it brought a new way of thinking among people, a new way of expressing themselves, of uh, advo advocating for themselves. Those were, I think, skills that people did not learn during Soviet times or they were not encouraged to uh, nurture. So yes, in that regard, I think, uh, as we saw in the Vel during the Velvet Revolution uh, a few months ago, uh, the leaders of that revolution were students. Many of them also came from uh, the American University of Armenia, who took the initiative to demand change and the resignation of uh, the um, the president, the, I mean, the, the, um, the prime minister at the time, Mr. Serge Sarkisian, who was the previous president. So I think without this university, maybe such uh, a change and such... Uh, a peaceful way would not have been possible. But that's also a speculation. I have oh, no... So, so, yeah. so, so this education helped educate the societies more? Uh, it has, definitely, because it has brought a new way of uh, thinking about personal, about rights that societies have and uh, their expectations of their governments have also changed over time. Thank you. Last time I didn't have a chance to talk to you. So I thought, so I, thought I would do it. So now all the kids, like um, Mary, had, we went to the polling station, you know, asking people questions, stuff like that. And it was her first year to vote. And so I had to make the video how she put the things in it. But the people were so excited, but they were all mindset to vote for this mayor, you know. But it was a good experiment, uh, so we witnessed that. Um, so you don't vote here. Do you vote here? No, you don't vote here, okay. So there were, uh, honestly, there was that one lady, she came with a can, and she refused to come with taxi. She says, this is my, what was it? Yeah, third time. Only she voted. But she says, this one I know is the free vote. You know, it was it was amazing emotional time like when I saw that. But uh, there was um, Mary's friend, she was the monitor, right? There was a polling, poll, polling monitor. And uh, so I said, Mary, uh, I said, what was her name? I call him Sweet, Sweet, Sweet Lana. And I said, did you, did you go to university? She said, no, but I like to go to American university, but I can't afford it. So do you guys have any program for people like that? It's amazing that people don't know it because every opportunity we announce it, that financial capacity is not a criterion. We have a policy called need blind admissions. That is, we admit students on the basis of their academic qualifications, irrespective of their capacity to pay the tuition. Once they are admitted, then we look and see if this student needs help with the tuition. 
50% of our students get financial aid. This student could easily come here. In fact, there are students who get 90% or even 100% waiver on the tuition. And no matter how many times we say this, every opportunity I have on television, on radio, every opportunity, I emphasize this. And yet, people say, Ameri I can't afford America. Wow. This is why I wanted to bring this subject. Yes. Because, uh, you, know, you know, so we have this need blind admission policy, meaning we don't consider the financial capacity of the student in the decision to admit the student. Once they, they are admitted, we have a whole process of determining whether a student needs help or not, and how much help they need. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate that, because we will push that one, you know, to make, because I remember when you came to Los Angeles, and you guys talked about it, that there were some students, how you guys helped, and uh, I remember that. Yeah, I even videotaped that stuff, you know. So just, just to emphasize this point, I want to show you, this is our graduation booklet. You see, endowed scholarship recipients, this annual scholarship recipient. Look at these names. They, these are names of students okay, who receive financial aid. Yeah. So every year, you know, people uh, provide us with uh, scholarship, named scholarships, and we give it to students, and they, uh, they know who they receive scholarship from a certain person. They end up communicating with that person, and so it's a wonderful program. Thank you, because I get people ask, I get people ask me lots of this question. They, uh, some, of the, some of the people said, when you say American universities, oh, well, that's for the rich people, for all our geese. I, you know, many times, I, I, I we, the same thing about medical universities. Yeah. They say about the, the same thing about the medical universities? Yeah, they say it's for the rich people. Why do they create these uh, false rumors? I don't know. I mean, in the medical university, there are no scholarships. So Everybody has to pay their own yes. tuition. Only um, the soldiers get free tuition. Yeah. No, they get 10% discount. Yeah, but that's like 100,000 drums. It's not helping much. Mm. So it's expensive. Uh, about <coughs> yes. about 50% of our students oh. from Armenia, Java, all students from Syria, by the way, Syrian Armenians who are here, they, they receive financial aid. I can't study something. But you Today. probably, we, you will not qualify <laughs> for financial aid. <laughs> no, see, like no financial aid for me. Now, um, I was going to ask this. Um, do you have a shortage of teachers or professors? Well, we are constantly hiring for professors, but lo both locally and from abroad. We are gradually increasing our full-time faculty. There are many who teach as adjuncts. We try to increase the ratio of full-time to adjunct faculty. Uh, we want to also increase the number of international faculty because diversity is important. We want to get different points of view. Our students be exposed to different ways of thinking, different points of view, different cultures. Uh, we also want to attract international students, including diaspora and Armenians, because they again enrich. We uh, was doing calculations cheaper today. To oh, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, a lot cheaper to be uh, coming here than uh, going under debt. In, yes. Uh, our, for international students, our tuition is about $8,000 plus minus per year, depending on the field. Uh, but many students, international students, also get some uh, merit scholarships, so that turns out to be less than that. However, if they are Armenian, and if they get this 10-year special visa or passport, or they adopt, uh, they take Amer Armenian citizenship, then we treat them just like 
and in, so the tuition then is 4,000 plus minus a year. We, we have, this semester, we have 233 international students from 29 countries. Uh, of course, many of them are of Armenian uh, descent, but we also have uh, Indians, Persians, uh, Iranians, Syrians, Iraqis, Koreans, uh, from many different countries. Yeah. Americans. We have 40 Americans here. Wow. Okay. So tell us, tell us something that we didn't hear. Oh, wow. Uh, re regarding the university, yeah. Um, I, I think you heard everything that is worth hearing. Yes. So. Because that one is everybody says, no, it's for the rich people. So, yes, I also want to emphasize that although this university uh, has the image of being an elitist institution, it is absolutely not elitist. As Armin said, it's a university that doesn't discriminate against social, socioeconomics, uh, race, uh, sexual orientation, sexual preference, uh, gender. So, um, uh, but for some reason, uh, you know, and the, the admissions office along with the entire administrative uh, staff is working hard at uh, getting that message across. Thanks. How are you financing this place? Well, we are independent, uh, an independent university, so we are not a state university. We don't get funding from either the U.S. government or the Armenian government towards our operational budget. The Armenian government provides, just like other universities, provides some um, uh, part of the tuition for disadvantaged kids coming from border areas or children of deceased uh, uh, soldiers. Uh, uh, so some number like that, uh, a small amount, but still very much appreciated. Uh, the operating budget, for the most part, is covered either directly or indirectly by donations. Uh, directly because there are people who donate annually, uh, indirectly because people have donated endowments, and this endowment is uh, providing annual payout. We use a part of the payout. So about 25, 20, 25% of our operating budget comes from the endowments. Uh, about 30% comes from tuition, uh, some comes, uh, 20 or so percent comes from annual donations that people make to us. Uh, then we have some uh, revenue generating assets. The AUS Center is a rental building. Again, it was a donated, so it's indirect again. Uh, uh, Barsam Suites Hotel is a... No, no. We depend on annual donations. Well, this, yeah, okay. So the donation is consistent. Like well, uh, we are fortunate that we have enough donors that annually make donations or give endowments to sustain us what, financially. What is and I must insist to emphasize this. We are very frugal. We are very careful with the funds. So we, the president, when he has to travel, he travels economy class. <laughs> uh, and uh, everyone here is very conscious of, we know these are monies that have been donated for good purpose, so we don't uh, waste them. Uh, we are very good stewards of the money. And I must also acknowledge that that's the operational budget. We also have capacity building. And there we have benefited a lot from the American Schools and Hospitals Abroad program of USAID, generosity of the American people. Uh, so far, we have received about 
13 mil, more than $13 million to renovate, to build. Our library you saw is really first-rate library. Yeah. That was renovated, built with uh, USAID help. You saw the uh, prototyping lab that was built. You will see soon the student union, the faculty center, which we opened two days ago. That was built with the USAID support. Right now we are building a dormitory building. The building itself, half finished, was donated to us by Carolyn and George Najarian from Boston. And USAID provided us a million dollar to renovate. Right now construction is going on and next fall hopefully we will have, uh, have it ready for students to move in. Before I forget, there was an American uh, Armenian Bar Association. You were cutting some ribbon and they were going to, is that for here or? Uh, uh... Yeah, the American uh, Armenian Bar Association uh, provided uh, some funding to support a legal clinic for technology and innovation legal clinic. This is our own law program students who under supervision of the faculty will provide support to startups uh, uh, within the university and some startups outside uh, with, with their legal help. You know, how to approach VCs, what how to negotiate, how to come up with agreement within their own team, and things of this sort. So it's to create a technology and innovation legal clinic. It will also be a good experience for our own students to work and advise on this, to develop experience in working in technology and innovation area. I want to add one more thing. You said, what hasn't been said yet? So, Wally, um, I realize that you have been highly impressed by this tour and uh, this university, the way you see it has uh, got, w surprised you in many ways because it uh, exceeded your expectations. That's my impression. And uh, as uh, the uh, president's wife, I have hosted many tours uh, in the past and uh, many people like you uh, almost everybody that has toured this university has had a similar reaction to the tour and their impressions have been very positive. Therefore, I would like to say that anybody visiting from the diaspora, Europe, the United States, South America, Canada, I encourage them all to include a tour of AUA on their itinerary next time they are visiting Armenia. It really uh, will change their outlook on uh, the future of this country. I have put that quite a bit about it. I didn't know that. I thought, I thought, just I have the privilege. Now I know you guys, I came here. But I didn't know like everybody could come. So this is great. Let them come see this marble place. You know, this is, this Last, is. Yesterday we hosted a group uh, from uh, the uh, AMAA that is visiting Armenia at the present. And a group of them decided to tour the, United, uh, the American University of Armenia. And they, had, they were similarly highly impressed by what they saw. One, one suggestion, Wally. As you go around, I suggest uh, you also ha interview some of the students. You'll see them. Oh, Just, I'm yeah, stop, was, stop in, uh, go to the student I union. Yeah. With them too. Yes, yes, but take. I was, like, didn't want to disturb them. I was respecting them. She saw a couple of them did, but and then I just sort of didn't want No, to. if you go to the student union, they're gathered there and you can ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about your retirement. Why are you retiring? It's too early. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, let, let me not comment on that. There is a search going on, okay. and yes, uh, okay. I've, I've, uh, I must say, the, during the time that I've spent and I'm spending here now as president has been the most fruitful, the most uh, inspiring, and most gratifying period of my life. I, I really thank you. You did, you did so much for this Armenia. It's, 
as the people like you that I always love to talk to. You know, you guys are our treasure. There is another word I could say, you know. I mean, we, we covered lots of things. Do you have any? Okay. We'll do the tour. We'll take some pictures here. And uh, I thank you very much.